Okay, it's uh, 10 o'clock, so uh, good morning everyone and welcome to this symposium on um, trade-dependent diversification on islands. I'm Frederick Lenz, I'm working at Naturalis Biodiversity Center in the Netherlands and co-organizer of this uh, symposium is Jose Maria Fernandez Palacios from the University of La Laguna, Tenerife, Canary Islands. Um, the main reason for choosing this topic, trade-dependent diversification on islands for this uh, symposium, is that we believe that um, it's one of the most fascinating questions in, in island biology, or perhaps also evolution, to find out like why some clades diversify and why some others do not diversify. So um, I'm very glad that we have a nice set of um, uh, five speakers today. Uh, when we first submitted uh, this symposium, um, we had another um, order of speakers in mind, um, but um, the organizers of the conference apparently um, have changed our order, uh, which, which is okay. Um, having said that, I would like to thank the organizers of the conference uh, for allowing us to have this symposium. So, I will be the first speaker of today. Um, I will talk about insular woodiness and its potential impact on diversification. Jose Maria will talk about um, the role of island rule um, features on extinction. Then uh, Rampal Etienne from the University of Groningen, uh, he will talk about um, diversification models and ways to um, estimate diversification. Renske Onstein from uh, IDIF, um, she will talk about the impact of frugivory traits in palm radiations. And then last but not least, we have Anna Papadoplo from the University of Cyprus. And uh, her talk will be about the role of ecological traits driving uh, beetle radiation. So, yeah, I cannot wait to start with this symposium. Uh, Jose Maria, can I ask you to announce the first speaker of today? Okay, thank you so much for being here today, for choosing our symposium after such a long night, and to be awake. We are going to begin it with our very first speaker, Frederic Lenz. I would say from him that it's not yet a very good friend and colleague, but he's also one of the bosses nowadays in island secondary woodiness. So, and the idea was not that the organizers were the first speakers, but there was some, um, we are sure, involuntary uh, mistake. And so we are not going to change it now because the people have already made their plans. So, Frederick, you know you have 15 minutes and then five minutes for questions. Yes. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you. Well, I would like today uh, to talk about my pet topic, which is um, island woodiness or derived woodiness um, and its potential role on. Uh, diversification. So for those of you who have uh, listened to the talk by uh, Alex Siska yesterday, uh, probably this slide and the next slide will be superfluous. Um, but for those who haven't heard this talk, uh, I will shortly introduce the topic. So this guy here at the left, you all know him, he's Charles Darwin. At the age of 27, when he just returned from his five-year voyage around the world, and as you all know, huh, he looked at uh, lots of different um, animals and plant species, amongst other things. But one of the amazing discoveries he made on islands was that he saw some strangely looking woody species um, belonging to families of which he only knew herbaceous life forms in, in Western Europe, like for instance, the daisy family. He called these species insular woody species. In his book on the origin of species, he correctly interpreted the uh, phenomenon insular woodiness because he mentioned that these strangely looking woody species must have been evolved from herbaceous colonizers that once reached the islands. And 
we now know based on molecular evidence and uh, fossil data that the woody state is the ancestral state within flowering plants. So we call these species ancestrally woody species. Most of the woody species in angiosperms are ancestrally woody. So but that, that also means that all the non-woody species, so the herbaceous species, have lost their wood formation during evolutionary history. And the interesting thing is that some of these herbaceous lineages have turned back into the woody states. So this is a derived woody state. We call this species derived woody species. The difference between derived woody and insular woody is that derived woody is a much broader term um, reflecting evolutionary transitions from herbaceousness towards derived woodiness, not only on islands, but also on continents, while insular woodiness is specific for wood development within the islands. Okay, Darwin was also one of the first that tried to explain why species would become woody on islands. I won't go into detail here um, because of lack of time, um, but I do want to emphasize uh, that in addition to the classical hypothesis about insular woodiness, um, I've also raised a novel hypothesis linking increased wood formation in these herbaceous clades with increased drought stress resistance. And I have some good evidence for that, which I will briefly comment on in this presentation. Okay, how can we now trace derived woodiness or insular woodiness? By, of course, introducing a molecular phylogeny, by plotting the habit features on the, uh, uh, on the phylogeny. This is an example of Achium, one of the iconic examples of insular woodiness for the canaries. And if you look at this uh, phylogeny um, more in detail, we see that all these early diverging lineages comprise herbaceous species. These herbaceous species are native to uh, continental Europe and the Mediterranean region. But at one point during evolution, it was about three million years ago, an herbaceous population reached the Canary Islands, which led to a rapid radiation into lots of insular woody species. And when I refer to woody species, I really mean woody species, so shrubs or even small trees. And I do not refer to all these different intermediate life stages you have in nature, where the herbaceous species have a, um, a woody basal stem part, but the wood cylinder does not reach uh, further uh, towards the stem apex. So I only take into account the truly woody shrubs, um, uh, trees, and, and, and some lianas as well. Okay, Achium is not the only representative of uh, insular woody clades uh, on the Canaries. In total, we have found um, 220 insular woody species belong to 34 genera and uh, 15 different families. The families are indicated here in, in these red branches uh, in the angiosperm tree of life. So basically, it shows a convergent evolution towards the woody state on the Canaries. Okay, so these 220 insular woody species native to the Canary Islands, they represent about 20% of what I call the traditional dicots, or in other words, the non-monocot flowering plants. Why is it uh, important to only look at um, or to discard the monocots? Because monocots never produce wood. So in other words, if you want to uh, know why some herbaceous species develop into woody species, and while some others do not develop into woody species, you have to only look at these herbaceous species that are genetically able to produce wood. Okay, so 20% um, is a rather uh, considerable proportion of insular woodiness compared to the total number of uh, these non monocot uh, flowering plants native to the canaries. But what's perhaps more interesting is that there are three times as much herbaceous species, herbaceous species belonging to the non monocot angiosperms native to the canaries. These herbaceous species belong to genera that did not radiate or that only radiate in, in like a, a few number of species. This is uh, shown here more in detail. So I've listed here the top 10 uh, species rich genera uh, on the canaries. And eight out of 10 of these genera, they account for about 70% of the total number of insular woody species on the canaries. So in other words, 
for the Canary Islands, there seems to be a link between insular woodness and diversification. Is it also uh, true for Hawaii? I would say yes and no. Um, yes, for some um, lineages like uh, Keratandra, for instance, that's an insular woody genus, um, or insular woody lineage native to the uh, native to Hawaii. Um, it's also true for um, the famous Silver Sword Alliance and for Kadawa, which is um, a member of uh, the Rubiaceae family. It is, however, not true for the most species rich lineage uh, on Hawaii, the Hawaiian lobeliates. And why is that? The Hawaiian lobeliates um, developed their wood formation not within Hawaii, but on African mountain tops. So this is one of the examples of a derived woody lineage on islands that is not insular woody. Okay, other examples of species-rich lineages um, on Hawaii that are not insular woody um, are um, Melicope um, plus Platidesma, this one. That's an example of a ancestrally woody uh, Rutaceae lineage. And the Hawaiian mints, this glade here, um, it's quite species-rich with about 60 species, but only 11 of them are in Slowoody and the species belong to the genus Philostagia. Okay, um, so this brings us to the question uh, whether the transition from herbaceousness towards woodiness has boosted um, diversification or not. Well, in a recent paper by uh, Nurk et, et al., um, they have um, basically linked um, shifts in diversification rates with shifts in um, the transition towards derived woodiness. So they've looked at four specific clades. All four of them um, have developed lots of derived woody lineages uh, on the Andes, like um, Lupinus and Hypericum. And the other two, the top two examples, are two insular woody clades, uh, and Achium and, and, and the Silver Sword Alliance. Of course, this is kind of Cherry picking, eh? if you only look at these clades that have lots of insular woody species or derived woody species, you will find a link between diversification and the transition towards woodness. But most other papers have highlighted actually the opposite. So in a quite famous paper by Smith and Donoghue, uh, they have emphasized that um, the shorter lifespan in herbaceous species um, can be, um, a, have boosted uh, the higher rates of molecular evolution. So this is shown by these um, boxes here. So the green color refers to herbaceous species, and these box plots uh, refer to the uh, rates of, of molecular evolution, which are always higher in the herbaceous species compared to the um, woody uh, relatives. Also in a famous paper by uh, Thomas Gifnish on plant speciation, um, he, um, he wrote that um, herbaceous species have roughly four times as many species as their um, ancestrally woody sister lineages. So again, uh, it seems that when you look at the pattern globally, that herbaceous lineages are more species diverse than their woody relatives. But most of these woody relatives are ancestrally woody. Okay, so to know more about the transition towards woodiness, um, I have started about 10 years ago to compile a um, list of derived woody species within angiosperms. And I thought I would finish this list within like two years or so, um, but it's, it was much more work than I anticipated. Um, reason for that is you have to go through hundreds of molecular phylogenies, which is still okay, but then you have to know which of the species in all these phylogenies are woody, which are herbaceous, uh, in order to trace the origin of woodiness within a particular clade. And for some groups, it was very painful because just finding basic information like growth form was, 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 was very challenging. So, okay, it took me 10 years. Okay, but now I finished the first version of, of, uh, of the database. I found so far nearly 7,000 woody species that have 
um, evolved from herbaceous relatives, belong to more than 600 genera and 45 families. So this database shows that the 7,000 derived to this species um, are the result of at least 600 independent shifts towards wood formation. At least 600 shifts, which is quite amazing, I think. Most of these 7,000 species occur on continents, not on islands. And if, you, if we look only at the continental species, then most of them occur in regions with a marked drought period. So that's the reason why I've um, proposed that novel um, drought hypothesis. And we have also now gained some extra experimental evidence that this drought hypothesis is indeed confirmed in several lineages, but I won't go into that uh, in this presentation. So some um, preliminary results of, of, um, of the database. Hawaii is by far the archipelago with most of the drive to this species, uh, about 340. Um, but the Hawaiian lobeliates uh, are part of, of them. So when only looking at the um, insular woody species, then the number of species between Hawaii and Canary Islands is very similar. So then followed by New Zealand, Madagascar, no New Guinea, uh, Mascarines, and, and so forth. In terms of families with most of the drive to the species on islands, Asteraceae is definitely number one. That also is true for um, the shifts towards derived woodiness on continents. So Asteraceae is a family um, that has undergone a huge number of shifts. Perhaps I should add here that Asteraceae is, is actually basically a ancestrally woody family. The early diverging lineages of Asteraceae are woody, so it's an ancestrally woody family. The same for Apiaceae, it's also ancestrally woody, but it also has a number of derived woody species. Okay, then the next slide about the top 10 genera with most of the derived um, woody species on islands. There we find Kirtandra on position number one. Uh, Kirtandra has irradiated in nearly all Pacific archipelagos, um, followed by Veronica, um, which radiated in New Zealand and mainly New Zealand and New Guinea. Siania is one of these examples of the Hawaiian lobeliot, so uh, this is an example of a non. Uh, um, non-insular woody clade that is derived to the on islands. Uh, Psiaria is a group that has radiated in this region of the world a lot and, and so forth and so forth. Okay. But perhaps more interesting than just um, uh, looking at, at, at these numbers is the fact that if you only um, look at the famous radiations, um, including more than 20 species, we see that they only account for 7% of the total number of derived woody genera on islands. About 40% did not radiate at all, so they only have one species. And an additional 30% have evolved into two species, three species mostly, um, and occasionally four to five. So this suggests that perhaps in some clades, in these famous insular woody radiations, wood formation may have contributed to diversification, but in many um, other clades of derived woodiness on islands, perhaps the transition towards woodiness um, may have led to a kind of evolutionary dead end. So that's something we, we have to dive into in the next couple of months. Okay, some conclusions and future plans. So um, derived woodiness is still definitely an island phenomenon, although we have underestimated the fact that it occurs much more on continents than we anticipated. The famous insular woody radiations uh, are well known, but are actually rather an exception. And many more of the derived woody um, genera native to islands um, did not radiate or did only poorly radiate. There are a number of bottlenecks um, when looking at trade-dependent diversification on islands. Um, one is we should never look at one single character. Um, I'm the first one to uh, emphasize that. Even in a clade like uh, the silver swords, um, when, you when you want to um, 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 investigate um, radiation, uh, you should also look at other potentially um, interesting characters like seed and food characters. Um, Rampal will talk about um, some models of diversification, so I won't go into that here. 
Um, and there's definitely also a great need to have much more phylogenies because these phylogenies are really essential for these um, island diversification models. And um, so I also want to add here that um, Alex Ziska, uh, where is Alex? Uh, there is Alex. Alex is uh, currently uh, analyzing the database for his poster project and he's doing all kinds of uh, fancy analysis uh, regarding um, uh, biogeographical, um, to unravel biogeographical patterns, to look at niche modeling between woody, the derived woody and herbaceous species, and testing hypothesis. So uh, stay tuned, the first paper will um, be published hopefully next year. Okay, so this is my last slide. I just want to say here that um, the work I presented is part of a, of a larger project where we want to know why plants became woody during evolutionary history using a multidisciplinary approach linking models of evolution and ecology with experimental work focusing on water transport um, in stems of these woody and herbaceous species that give us an idea about the level of drought stress resistance of a given species. And hopefully this approach will lead us to, to a novel synthesis that will change our way um, of uh, thinking about wood formation. Merci. Thank you so much, Frederic. Now we have time for several questions. Are there any? Oops, no Okay. Hi, uh, you mentioned like the um, transition to woodiness was like 600 evolutionary transitions. How do you define one evolutionary transition and do they kind of happen in connected groups, sort of like bunches of them all at once or, or how does that work? So I don't know whether I understand your question correctly. So well, how do you define one evolutionary transition? Okay, so basically by screening uh, molecular phylogenies and by plotted plotting the habit data on, on that phylogeny in order to um, do some trait reconstruction analysis and to know whether the woody state is derived or, 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 or ancestral. That's, that's the way to do it. Okay. <coughs> okay. Hi. Um, do you see any bias towards some geographical regions in the phylogenies or some families since some regions may have more interests and they are more studied than others and families as well? Um, well, um, that's a good point. Um, for some regions, like for instance, um, the Cape Flora, um, there are a number of families that uh, have really radiated into lots of derived woody species. So I'm thinking about I Isoaceae, for instance. So that's a reason why that particular region is rich in derived woody species. Um, that's also true for a number of um, for a number of islands where the insular woody radiations um, have produced lots of insular woody species. So it's indeed also clade specific. So I've shown that most of the derived woody species belong to the asteroids clade, so the more derived clade of angiosperms. If a particular flora, like the um, flora of, of New Caledonia, uh, which has a really a unique flora with not that many um, asteroids proportionally. There we, we hardly see any any uh, insular woody species, so it's also indeed clade specific the patterns we see. Okay, here is another one. Jim, here. Thank you. Um, <coughs> a couple decades ago, we looked at <coughs> verbascum in Hawaii, uh, introduced alien species, and. Within 50 years, I mean, I'm sure it was phenotypic, but it was showing conversion from monocarpic to polycarpic, increased woodiness, um, um, perennial to uh, annual to perennial, uh, increased heights, doubling heights, all uh, seemingly at least partially accounted for by the reduced seasonality in that situation. We never investigated the genetics of the situation, but it seemed to be following Carlquist's insular arborescence model you know, in a matter of decades. <laughs> yeah, well, that is indeed fascinating. Uh, I have a similar kind of example um, 
for the, uh, the walking stick cabbage. Um, so in, on the Canary Islands, um, there are some, um, some uh, cabbages that, that uh, grow into like um, uh, monocal uh, phenotypes, uh, woody phenotypes, more than three, four, four meters high. Um, and, and we know that um, because cabbage is not a native species for the Canary Islands, so it must have been introduced by the Guanches, the uh, original population of the Canaries, and it has been um, um, introduced to the island by, by trade with, with, with the Portuguese. So that has happened uh, 3,000 years ago, maximum. So in these 3,000 years, we have like the, the evolution from like a normal cabbage into a cabbage of, of, of three, four, five, five meters tall, which is really amazing. It, it can happen very quickly, apparently. And we'd be very interested to know more about the uh, verbascum uh, example you have, uh, you have referred to. Thank you. Okay, is there a final, final question over there? Thank you. <coughs> Um, you, you, you mentioned uh, a potential dead hand or bottleneck of woodiness. Did, did you Sorry, hear me? Potential? Sorry. Yeah, uh, dead hand, uh, bottleneck of woodiness. Okay, dead hand, yes. uh, so that's if you could just develop this idea. And uh, another related question is whether uh, you would know who the oldest lineages of woody species. Uh, is it Sorry, is I, I don't un understand you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, is it that's a recent evolution, woodiness, or yeah. is it ancient? And yeah. if it's ancient, do you have any uh, datation date for the oldest um, yeah. okay. evolution of woodiness? Well, Thank you. Yeah, uh, so derived woodiness is, is, of course, a derived state. And um, uh, I have to look closely to... Um, to all the derived wooden wood images and, and how old they are, but um, I'm pretty sure that most of them will be less than five million years, and 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 with this within these uh, r relatively young lineages, I guess most of them will be younger than three million years. So it's a very recent phenomenon in geological time, and the oldest insular woody clade that I am aware of uh, is probably going to be Ixantus, which is about 15 million years old, and then the Canary Islands. Uh, but I don't expect that there will be many lineages, derived to the lineages that are older than 20 million years. I, but, and if any, that would be rather exceptional. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And I have my own last question, just curiosity. Frederick, is there something such as secondary insular herbaceousness? Yes, very good point. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, like Akim, for instance, is an example. Um, um, but it's very exceptional as well. So basically, if, if you follow the evolution of growth forms in, in, in angiosperms, you have like ancestrally woodiness, herbaceousness, derived woodiness, and then in some cases, secondary herbaceousness. That does happen on islands also in some continental derived woody clades, but it's very exceptional. And these groups are of course very interesting to, to look at some uh, niche comparisons eh, in these derived woody uh, species and these um, r relatives that are derived herbaceous to, uh, yeah, to have a better idea why um, these derived herbaceous species go back to the herbaceous states. It's, it's crazy, but it, it does happen. Okay, thank you very much. So it's my great pleasure to um, announce uh, the second speaker of this symposium, Jose Maria Fernandez Palacios. He will talk about the dark sides of the island rule. Oh, please. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to everybody. My my talk today is going to be really simple. Just a couple of ideas, not too much. Okay. And it is called the dark side of the island rule, or how traits are carried on islands make endemic species vulnerable to extinction. Uh, I will begin with island contribution to global geographic data to show you how the contribution of islands is increasingly, as soon as we go from area to um, threatened species to extinct species. New Guinea 
0.785 million square kilometers is considered to be the largest island today. Although Greenland is larger, more than 2 million square kilometers, is actually a set of islands united by an ice cap. On the other hand, Australia, the smallest continent, with 7.5 million square kilometers, so that we have an order of magnitude that differentiates very well the largest island from the smallest continent. The, so islands without Greenland comprise circa 4% of the emerged land in the Earth. And islands are also home for circa 10% of the world pop human population and one-fourth of the world sovereign states. Okay. Just to pick you an example, in the European Union overseas entities, all being islands with the exception of Fren Guayana, harbor the 80% of the European Union biodiversity. And here you have an example of islands or archipelagos that really contribute to the world's biodiversity that is circa a 25% all over the taxa. Polynesia, Galapagos, Caribbean, Macaronesia, Mediterranean, Gulf of Guinea Islands, Madagascar and satellites, Micronesia in Japan, Indonesia and Philippines, or Melanesia and New Zealand. And here you have a list, I'm not going to go through it, but I have highlighted in bold those lineages comprising more than 100 endemic species on the different archipelagos I have just listed to you. But this biodiversity is also in peril. And here I, I gather some numbers of the IUCN and the threatened species, circa 60% of the world threatened species are insular species. And extinct species, circa 80% of the species that went extinct after their discovery and description, some 800, were also insular species. You may notice how the pie graph is aumenting and aumenting, the contribution of island. And this is an IUCN list that lists the territories of the Earth with the highest percentage of extinct or threatened either birds or mammals. And, oh, <laughs> the uh, red ellipse is not more in pointing to Bhutan. Bhutan is the single of these territories that is not insular. Okay, the first 15 for mammals and for birds with more percentage of either threatened or extinct species are insular territories. And here we have also a list of the late quaternary, last four south, uh, 40 southern years before the present, of anthropogenic pre-description species extinctions of endemic vertebrate genera by territories. Uh, this was uh, done taking of various sources. What do I mean with pre-description extinction? Those species that went extinguished before they were described for science. And have a look, here we have the continents over there, then the sum of the continents and the islands. Islands in mammals, birds, reptiles, and total islands accounting for almost a 60% of the extinct genera that were extinct before the description. And if we consider the number of terrestrial species of major taxa extinct and percentage of island contribution for post-description extinction, those species that were first described and then go on extinct, usually the description of new species begins something like the, in the beginning of the um, 15th century. Uh, and taking again data from the IUCN, you will see that for the different taxa, the contribution of islands to those extinctions is really important. Mammals, more than 50%, birds, 94%, reptiles, almost 90% frogs, 60 mollusks, almost 70, and so on. And the total, the total is more or less close to 70% of the contribution of islands. And this is also a nice, a nice table where we can find the brief statistic about archipelagos contributing with endemic genera extinction due to human activities. And here we have the list of the archipelagos. In the second column, you will see the approximate age or date of human colonization. And then we have the list of the other, other taxa mammals, birds, reptiles, and total. Have a look to those with an asterisk. 
Those archipelagos within Asterix in the date mean that there were already aborigines before the European expansion. So when the Europeans reached them, there were already people living there. Well, the other archipelagos were already discovered for the first time by uh, Europeans. And if you have a look on it, the red ellipses encircle the total extinction of endemic genera, and they coincide always with archipelagos that were already populated by aborigines before the European arrival. Keep that in mind. In total, 118 endemic genera were extinct in the different archipelagos and oceanic islands all over the world. And in this table, I have made some numbers also um, consulting IUCN and other sources. And here I would like to highlight the ascending insular contribution, first to global biodiversity, second to global threatened biodiversity, and finally to post-description species extinction. And I have just do that with only well-known, more than 95% of the total extinct species reaching existing, and well-evaluate more than 95% of the existing species in the group. Have a look to mammals, birds, or amphibia, they have a similar pattern on reptiles. So the insular contribution to global diversity, for instance, for mammals is 12.7%, for birds 15.9%, amphibia 16.7%, and reptiles 17.7%. But if you go to the column number five, you will see the insular contribution to threatened species is already doubled, 30.8, 33, 22, 48. And the final column is giving you the insular contribution to the extinction. And there you will see numbers like 54 for mammals, 94 for birds, and so on. On the other hand, conifers, although the islands also contribute with a lot of uh, threatened species, there are no extinction has been so far record, neither for cichads. OK, this is a fact. Okay, the islands contribute exceptionally for the area for threatened and extinct species. Yeah, but why is this so? And I think there are three main drivers. On the one hand, the fragility of island biotas due to the intrinsic island characteristics. Volcanism, landslides, tsunamis, sea level transgressions, hurricanes. The consequence is partial global island sterilization, collapse, impact of coastal ecosystems, sea level transgression, means summit ecosystem disappearance with non whole island disappearance or hurricanes with periodic stream events. This is happening without humans. This has happened forever and will happen in the future. Okay, so human activity is not in implicated here. You can imagine that a landslide can affect, can, you can lose half of your island, half of your island in minutes, okay? And everything's gone to the ocean bottom. The second uh, me, uh, point or reason for the fragility of island biotas is uh, due to intrinsic, per se, either geographic, demographic, or genetic fragility factors. For instance, the small distribution range. Usually, island species are single island endemics. A recent comparison of the distribution range of island versus continental populations of the same species gave a ratio of 0.14 of the continental range of the species for islands. Not yet a single 1%. The consequence, higher extinction risk due to stochastic events, volcanism, landslides, and so on. Lower population size and less density compensation. Then we have also the natural fragment distribution run for species living in archipelagos, what means population structure genetic diversity, extirpations in an island imply always genetic heritage loss. Thus, populations should be the operational conservation units the meaning that that needs more resources. Also, a lower population size, meaning a lower effective population and risk of stochastic and democratic collapse. Few populations and few individuals per population, meaning ge that genetic drift controls evolution, implying non-adaptative path, and species not fitting the environment and breeding depression collapse. And finally, the population origin through a founder event used to imply population bottlenecks resulting in low and singular genetic diversity. This is also going without the human impact, okay? Before humans, number one and number two have always existed, but it is true that the arrival of human have accelerated this, say, natural rate of extinction. And finally, we came to the island rule. So this is the third mechanism of island extinction, and here we have Trends on island dwellers emerging irrespective of island taxonomic groups, increasing their vulnerability. 
In animals, we have already heard a lot about dwarfism, giantism, flightlessness, reduction in clutch size, reduction of aggressiveness, tameness. In plants, insulary secondary woodiness, loss of dispersibility, secondary diarrhea, loss of anti herbivory defense. In both of them, loss of contact with disease pathogens, and also in both of them, trophic cascade. Nothing happens? Okay, here we are. Let's have a look to the different uh, features of the island rules. Island rules used to create shifts in evolutionary pathways that make fitter, that makes a species to be fit in the island, in the island um, scenario. But this evolutionary path is not considering the arrival of human colonizers. And there is the main problem. This is the main problem. The giantism will have as a consequence a bigger reward for hunting source of meat. Just imagine the moas or the elephant bird in Madagascar. The dwarf fishing is a decrease of fierceness facilitating hunting or predation by introduced predations, just the gian rats of the canaries or the gian lice of the canaries. Flightlessness, usually combined with giantism, facilitates the hunting or depredation by introduced predators, like the dodo. Insular secondary woodiness creates species that are lodging, tired for firewood, weapons, and so on. Loss of dispersibility, the incapacity for escaping from induced disturbance. The trend towards secondary duration, functional duration, creates a difficulty in mating precarious demographic conditions after the human arrival. Diminution of the defensive behavior, tameness, naivety against hunting predation. There is a nice combination of hiantism, flightlessness, and naivety creating very, very uh, complicated situations for those animals when the humans came with their, with their, uh, anim with their introduced species. The loss of defenses, loss of plant defenses against herbivory is facility for predation by introduced herbivores, reduction of clutch size, less recovery potential during disturbance, and finally, locked, lack of contact with diseases or pathogens, vulnerability against import diseases. So somehow, all the evolutionary shifts within the island rule, although they are designed to make the species better in the environment, they are creating the conditions for the vulnerability after the human arrival. Some general rules of island extinctions. Island species have always been vulnerable, with or without humans living there. A trip in the time machine to any island before its human colonization would also produce a red book of endangered species. There are three main drives of extinction. Species lost due to intrinsic island features, spontaneous extinction driven by geological and climatical events, independent of human activity. Species lost due to intrinsic island population structure, spontaneous extinction driven by genetic demographic processes, independent of human activity, although humans when decimating populations accelerate the extinction rate. And finally, the species loss due to the evolutionary processes emerging on island species, what we call island rule, that make them more fit, but also more vulnerable to human impacts. No spontaneous extinction, this is important. This is not a spontaneous extinction like the other one. This is a spontaneous uh, um, extinction driven by human activities. And the lack of proofs to attribute such extinctions to human my idea is that it is merely a matter of the lack of anthropological research on islands. This week has been published a new paper by archaeologists that said the Homo sapiens sapiens was already 200,000 years ago populating the islands of Greece in the Aegean Sea. Okay? And very likely this will explain a lot of extinction in dwarf elephant that Alexander van der Geer showed us the other day. Mm -hmm. This is a matter of lack of archaeological research. Okay, some general rules. Number two, the drivers of cultural extinctions, with cultural extinctions, I, I am thinking in anthropogenic um, uh, extinctions on islands, are the first colonizers, irrespective of their technological development, either aborigines or Europeans. If the islands have been innovated by aborigines, examples like Hawaii, Marquesas, Rapa Nui, Canaries, Antilles, the European impact on extinction was less important because the majority of the species prone to go extinct have already been extinguished. 
If the islands were not previously in a bit, like Mauritius, La Reunion, Santilina, Juan Fernandez, Azores, Cape Verde, Madeira, were Europeans which drove the extinction wave. Result, shift from the late Pleistocene continental megafauna extinction to the Holocene insular megafauna and flora extinction, whose onset coincides with the human colonization of oceanic islands and is still ongoing. Message to take home, fact, islands contribute disproportionately to the area and increasing to the world biodiversity, world threatened species and pre and post description extinct species. There are three main extinction drivers, island natural processes which are independent of human activities, island populations demographical and genetic collapse which are independent of human activities. They have exist always, although the colonization of humans have accelerated this rate and finally, Island species evolutionary shift, island rule, which makes species fit better in the environment, but also more vulnerable to human activities. And the extinction of such species happens mainly due to human activity. And here we have my last slide, some insular charismatic species that have gone forever, like the dodo, the thylacine wolf, the elephant bird of Madagascar, the stellar sea cow from the Komodorskoye Islands in the Pacific Ocean, the Canarian Gian lizard, or the moas, and by th moas were hunted by Maoris and through trophic cascade, the hast eagle that was just feeding only on moas, the largest uh, bird of prey ever existing in New Zealand. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Jose Maria. Any questions? Richard Field from the University of Nottingham. Hi, Jose Maria. Very interesting as always. Uh, several people I've been having discussions with at uh, this conference, we've been trying to work out whether extinction on islands naturally, so before humans, um, would have been more or less than extinction on mainlands. Do you have a view on that? Because you've given a lot of reasons why island species are naturally vulnerable, but of course there may be reduced competition and so on. So do you have a view on whether natural island extinctions are, tend to be more than on the continents or less? Well, uh, Richard, I think that it's a matter of the problem is comparing very, very different areas. The continents may be considered also islands, so uh, larger than New Zealand, we have five islands more. Okay, and those are the continents, and they are really, really. Uh, very large, very large, and make hard any comparison. But I think that if we consider some examples, there is a, a case that is always shocking me. Lord Howe Island in Australia is, I think, 11 square kilometers large and account for more bird extinctions than Asia and Africa together. I am sure that islands are much more prone also to natural extinctions because many of those. Uh, uh, say, uh, issues that happen there, like uh, volcanism, also volcanic happens in the continent, but it is, it is not the limit. The landslides, tsunamis, and so on, this is always mainly affecting island. And a continent then can be ob obviously affected by, by a tsunami, but the island can be absolutely be, be barren. No? So I really think that the natural, not human induced, natural extinction on islands are also much larger than continents. Thank you. Another question? Yeah. Um, up here, how's it going? So, so th excellent talk. Um, I was just thinking, you know, as you were saying how important the geology of the environment was for, for extinction, um, one, one interesting kind of contrast to that was how Carson always said that this geological kind of um, dynamic of, of Hawaii, at least, is, is a crucible for evolution simply because it's continually fragmenting and, and reconnecting um, habitats. And so that actually creates um, an environment for fostering diversity. So how do you kind of balance the two, you know, where, where it, it causes extinction on the one hand, speciation on the other? 
Thanks, Rosie. This is a very good point. I, I agree absolutely. On the one hand, all these dynamisms, geological and climatic dynamism, are uh, yielding extinctions, but on the other hand, are creating new opportunities. Always when a new island, an island, I mean a new island emerged from volcanic activity or an old island is sterilized by volcanic activity, all the former biota will go gone, but there will be new opportunities for incomers from the continent or usually from uh, nearby islands. So this dynamism has a lot to do with the nature and the big endemicity of islands, obviously, but also with the demise of our biota. But this is a natural dynamism. But my point here was that humans, when they came, and this is not part to say so of the natural dynamics of islands, encounter or find their species that have somehow evolved for a beating better in harmony with their island environment, but simultaneously they became vulnerable. And this is why we are losing so these many, many nice and charismatic species all over the world. And this is a, a, a systematic rule everywhere, always. The arrival of humans. And my point here is that I asked that to Alexander in, in her talk, and she said to me that we don't have sometimes proof that humans were the cause of uh, these elephant uh, birds or, uh, or the dwarf mammoth of the Channel Islands, the responsible. But my point, and this is, this is not based in science, I think it's just an educated guess. My point is that the humans are always there. And if we don't have now proofs, it's just a matter of luck in research. That's my idea. But I may be wrong. Okay, thank you, Jose Maria. We have to stop here. Uh, so thank you very much for your, for your presentation. So our next speaker will be Rampal Etienne. He's an expert on diversification analysis. So yeah, looking forward to hear his talk. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so actually on Tuesday I already uh, did a talk where I was sort of filling in an empty slot. So I was just wondering how many of you attended that talk? I won't go into that talk, but I will actually, so this was actually, there were uh, uh, two parts. Um, and the first part, I'll skip through that very quickly. This is what you missed on Tuesday, if you weren't there. But, um, oops, I'll just go too quickly already. So, um, but I will show you the final slide of that, of, that, um, uh, of that presentation. So what we were doing there, we were actually um, uh, presenting a model uh, um, where we can explain the, uh, the number of, uh, to total number of species, number of cladogenetic species, number of uh, colonizations, and many other things, but they're actually shown here in this, in this uh, figure, uh, across the world for uh, avian uh, uh, diversity. And uh, what we saw there is, and so this is a model just uh, using area and distance from the mainland as explanatory factors. So we thought we did a pretty good job and actually with this very simple model. But what we see in this, in this, uh, in this uh, figure, of course, is that there are also some outliers, some uh, deviations from the general prediction. So those are the ones, the, the boxes in, in red and blue. And so you may wonder, so what are the explanations for this? Of course, you can go to every single island uh, or archipelago and then and say, well, this could be causing uh, sort of the, the deviations from the general, the general predictions. Uh, you could also do this more generally and say, okay, well, maybe what we, f we didn't do in this case is actually take into account island ontogeny. Uh, another thing you could, could say is, that of course, we treated species uh, basically as uh, very uh, similar. Um, and, uh, uh, but maybe actually there is lots of variation and uh, then of course traits come into play. Could it be that you know, there is a role for traits to explain this kind of deviations? So I won't be doing this for this particular example, but I will actually show how you can do this kind of analysis uh, where you take into account uh, uh, traits and their effect on diversification. So um, I will be doing this using an example on a, on a also on, a, on, a, on an island system, which is actually a lake, Lake Tanganyika, in uh, in Africa, and I'm looking at the uh, at, a, at a tribe of uh, cichlids, 
And what we are interested in is whether the depth preference, so that's the trait the, that we're looking at, whether that actually affects diversification. There are all kinds of reasons why depth preference uh, um, could evolve. I mean, of course, acro across uh, different depths, in uh, uh, the depth gradient in, in, in a lake, um, there's, of course, differences in light. There's differences in, in, in the communities of al algae, for example, that they might feed on. Uh, there's differences in parasites. So there's, there's lots of gradients uh, um, in the uh, biotic and abiotic circumstances that might influence uh, why, they, why the cichlids choose to be in a certain depth or not. And so what we're going to look at is whether uh, there is uh, diversification that depends on, on the particular traits. So. Um, Here's just an example where, uh, so the depth preference is here, it's like where do you want to be in the, in the, uh, in the lake? So this, this little thing is a lake where you either are in the deep part or in the shallow, uh, uh, in the shallow waters, or you're actually a generalist and you can actually occur across a broad range of, uh, of, of depth. Now, the diversification rate can then depend on this, uh, on this property. So whether if you're deep uh, in deep waters, you might have a different diversification rate than in the shallow waters. And that, of course, your preference might change over macroevolutionary time. So either it just happens gradually along a branch of a phylogenetic tree, or it happens during a speciation event. Okay, so what are the questions that, that we ask in this case? So do certain trait states actually hinder or do they actually foster diversification? Do trait changes actually uh, occur during speciation? And what are these rates actually of, uh, of trait change? So um, to answer these questions, we developed uh, a new method, which is, uh, um, this, um, uh, it's called uh, SECSSE, or short uh, SEXI, and uh, it's, it stands for Several Examined and Concealed State Dependent Speciation and Extinction. And so it belongs to the family of lots of these models, state dependent uh, speciation extinction model, uh, BISI, MUSI, um, CLASI, HISI, and well, there are a few more. So, but what, the, what, this, uh, what this model does, it actually allows for multiple states uh, or multiple traits. Um, so there is an R package uh, now available on CRAN, and uh, one important uh, aspect that a lot of the other uh, uh, predecessors uh, didn't inc include, except for the HISI model, is that it controls for a high type uh, one error that these other models uh, actually showed. So, and it does that by, uh, by including uh, hidden traits. But I'll, I'll, I'll uh, get into that a little bit later. Because, so this is what the model is. So we're, what we want to uh, um, uh, explain is actually this data that we have on the, on, the, on the right. So we have a phylogeny with a certain trait, which I just, here is just a binary trait, but it, in our, in our, uh, in our um, this method actually can apply to multiple trait states. Uh, so it could be any uh, number of, uh, of, of states that you have. And we want to actually explain this pattern, the phylogenetic pattern and the, the, the traits on that, on that phylogeny, at the tips of the phylogeny. So we take a birth-death model of diversification with speciation rates indicated by a lambda, uh, extinction rates indicated by a mu, and then uh, there is this subscript I there because it, what we of course want to do is we want to look at how these, um, uh, these rates of speciation and extinction depend on the actual trait state. And of course, then there is also a transition, transition rate, uh, which we indicate by QIJ, to actually go from one state to another uh, in macroevolutionary time. So we allow the traits to actually uh, change also during uh, speciations. Um, and um, uh, well, we did all the math to actually calculate the likelihood of, of this, well, for example, this particular uh, uh, data set where we have a phylogeny and the trait states on that, uh, on that phylogeny. And so why, why do we want to do that? Well, we want to use this likelihood to actually estimate the parameters and then compare models. So what are the models of trade change then that, that we considered? Well, there's, so there are two types of, of trade evolution. So there's trade evolution, which is more, uh, more or less gradual, where um, I've indicated this here with the, the three states that we have. We have generalists, uh, so general, uh, depth generalists, um, uh, and uh, uh, so that's indicated by a G. Then we have sh shallow water specialists indicated by an S and deep water specialists 
indicated by D. So you can look at all the transitions that are possible. Uh, you can exclude some of the, uh, of the transitions. For example, in the first uh, one on the uh, top left, we exclude uh, transitions from shallow water specialists to deep water specialists. They have to go through the generalist stage to, uh, uh, to, to get there. Uh, so you can, you can think of all the kind of combinations that, uh, that are possible. You can also say, well, are these rates different or are they the same? Uh, so these are all the scenarios that we're looking at here. So those are the sort of the gradual cha uh, trade changes. But you can also imagine that during speciation, actually, the, ch uh, the, the two daughter species might, uh, uh, might have different, um, uh, different traits than the ancestor. And so, so the, the, I guess the, the, the null model would be just there is dual inheritance. Both daughter species have the same trait as the ancestor, but all the other combinations are, uh, are also possible where the daughters have different trait states. So what we wanted to do then is to look at how these, uh, you know, the, 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 the depth preference changes, the shifts, how that would affect uh, the diversification. Well, the sort of a null model would be say there's no effect. That's the constant rate model on the left. Um, then, of course, what we're interested in is whether the trait that we're looking at, in this case, depth preference, influences the rates. So that's what you would see then on the, in, the, in the middle uh, figure, where it really is aligning with the, the actual depth uh, preference changes. Whereas on the right, we see actually that there is, might be something else that is actually causing variation in diversification rates. And that's exactly the thing that I was talking about, is that it, previous models didn't take that into account, and they uh, ended up with a very high type 1 error, because actually, um, you could have variation in diversification rates um, in a phylogenetic tree, uh, but that's not due to the trait that you're looking at. And they were actually sort of confounding these two, uh, these two factors. But now these hidden trait models like HISI and our own model SEXI is, uh, is, is able to, to uh, they are both able to uh, account for that. So uh, we use this method actually to apply to previous uh, um, uh, studies to, uh, that used uh, you know, previous methods without this high type one error correction. And uh, in well, seven, uh, six out of seven studies that reported uh, an effect of the, the trait that they examined on diversification, uh, we found actually to be uh, at least premature. Um, because the rate, the rate variation that they found, the diversification rate variation, is actually uh, should be attributed to some, some unknown trait. Okay, so well, then you may wonder, is this uh, method that we have uh, faring much better? So that's, we did some uh, simulations to, to look at that. So what we see here is uh, at the bottom, we see the, the, the three different models, the constant rate model, CR, the concealed trait dependent model, um, and the examined trait dependent model. And then the colors then indicate uh, uh, which model actually f uh, fitted the data best. So what you want is, of course, that the cons uh, on the left, the when it's the data is generated by the constant rate model, the whole thing should be uh, red. Um, uh, uh, it's not always the case, of course, so there is a, a bit of, a, of an error there, but um, by and large, of course, it, it's in this case, uh, it, is, uh, it is red. And the same for the CTD and the ETD model. So the CTD model, when it's generated, the data are generated by that, you would expect, uh, or you would hope at least, that the uh, CTD model is also picked as the best model, so everything should be blue. And uh, more or less, uh, uh, most of it actually is blue. And similarly for the ETD model, most should be green. And the top one actually shows that everything is green. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a good one. The other ones show a little bit of red. So you do make some errors. Depends, of course, on how much information there is in the data. But it fares a lot better than the, uh, than the previous models that didn't account for this. OK, so uh, we want to apply this now to the, uh, um, to the cichlids in Lake Tanganyika. And so we're looking at the Lamprodogini tribe, and so we had to uh, construct a, a phylogeny for that, uh, where we uh, just went on, on GenBank and uh, collected all the available data, because there's lots of data on cichlids out there, but it's still difficult to build this tree. Um, so uh, there's five genes involved, uh, assuming a fixed clock rate, and, uh, and, and of course calibration points to, to make a time tree. And uh, what else did we need? We, of course, also need uh, the trait data, in this case, the, uh, the depth preferences. Well, the, uh, the way uh, we can only get this is actually look at the distribution, so the vertical distribution data. You might think that is, of course, if you're an ecologist, well, that's the realized niche, not the actual preference that they might have. But that's, of course, what we have to, uh, to go with. So we're assuming that the depth preference is, is, uh, is rep well represented by the, wh where they actually currently occur. So we. Uh, um, 
so we, we looked at the, uh, the, uh, the species that are in the, uh, you know, in the shallow waters, the deep waters, and where they occur across the whole range up to uh, 30 meters depth. Okay, so we're fitting models to data. So I was already showing some of the, uh, the models that we're, we're looking at, but in total there were 168 models. So I'm not gonna show all these models, of course, but uh, what's important is they differed in whether the speciation and extinction or, or the extinction rate depends actually uh, on the examined traits or on, the, uh, or on a concealed trait or not at all when there is actually a constant rate model. They also differed in what type of trade change we, uh, uh, we assume uh, uh, that occurs during speciation, whether the, 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 the depth uh, preference is just inherited during speciation or whether actually the daughter species have different depth preferences. And also we, uh, the, the models differ in what, what transitions we allow between the different states. So we did the model fitting with maximum likelihood and model comparison just with uh, AIC, so very standard model selection uh, criteria. And uh, basically this is the result for the best model. And so what we found is that uh, the generalist, so the de depth water, uh, so the, de the, the depth generalist, so species that occur um, across the whole range, they have a much larger uh, uh, speciation rate than, uh, than the specialists. Um, so you can actually see these rates, so the rates are 1.37 and 0.28 and the histograms actually show some bootstrap uh, analysis just to see whether uh, these, uh, you know, what the, sort of the, um, the, the uncertainty is in these estimates and also to, it's a bit also uh, uh, to give an idea of the goodness of fit. So, um, you know, simulations with the model uh, would, uh, if you do the analysis on simulations, um, you see this, you see a similar uh, estimates. And we see that these actually, did, they differ quite a bit. Um, so also this, uh, another outcome that we found is actually shallow water species seem to be uh, a sort of a, a, a macroevolutionary endpoint because the, there is a transition, there's a fairly low transition rate towards shallow water uh, species, but once you're there, your transition rate back to the, uh, uh, to, to the general estate is, uh, is, well, practically zero. So you're sort of uh, stuck there as a shallow water spe uh, species. Of course, there might be all kinds of reasons, I won't go into that, why that is the case, um, but uh, it's interesting to find, uh, to find these kinds of, uh, uh, um, kind of results. Uh, first, uh, furthermore, what we, originally thought that would happen is that the generalist, for example, would split up into two specialists, a deep water and a, and a shallow water specialist during speciation. But we found no evidence for that. Uh, so apparently speciation uh, uh, is not uh, uh, in that sense driven by, or it's not actually associated with trade changes, but it is actually affected by the state because as I said, the generalist actually diversify much faster than the, uh, than the specialists. Um, so what we conclude is that we, well, we've uh, set up a new, new method to infer uh, uh, trade-dependent diversification. Uh, it's built on the pre previous models, uh, Massey and Hissey. It's actually sort of a combination between the two. Uh, what we also changed, I didn't uh, touch upon that because it's kind of technical, but it does proper conditioning uh, um, on non-extinction of the, of the species. Um, it has a low type one error rate and um, it can also uh, uh, actually be detect, uh, to be used to detect uh, uh, tra rate variations. So if you're not actually interested in whether a trait uh, influences your, uh, your diversification rates, you can still use the model uh, in terms of the concealed trait uh, dependence uh, to actually detect uh, uh, rate variation. And might, in th that way for those of you that are actually uh, know about this field might actually solve some of the problems that people have uh, discussed on uh, current models to detect diversification uh, rate uh, variation. Well, for the Lamprologini cichlids in Lake Tanganyika, Yika, we showed that uh, so depth generalists uh, really speciate much faster than uh, depth uh, specialists. Uh, that depth uh, preference um, does not actually change during speciation, and that shallow water species uh, represent an, uh, an uh, and back evolutionary dead end. So I was showing the other sign. This is actually the European one, and I just realized that maybe Americans would understand this one better. Um, but uh, uh, to conclude then, um, I want to thank actually the, my collaborators. So the part one that I presented on, on Tuesday, those people are on the top, but on the, on the bottom are the ones that uh, I collaborated with on, the, uh, on, this, uh, on this talk. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jan Paul. Any questions? Uh, 
Hi, I'm Julia Day from UCL. Um, great talk, but I was just interested in um, your model of whether you could include additional traits because the Lamprologini, um, as you know, sort of um, specialise in terms of their habitat and those shallow water species um, all tend to be species that um, are shell brooders as well. So I don't know if you've got any comments on that. Yes, well, so the, 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 the model was developed actually to deal with multiple states or multiple traits. So what you then do is actually the multiple trait case, you just translate that into a multiple state because uh, then you can just look at all the combinations, right? So then it becomes still a new sort of uh, combined trait, right? Uh, mm -hmm. For example, habitat preference and depth preference. And you combine that into, and then you look at all the, all the possible combinations as the states. So that's all you, we, we can do, deal with this uh, kind of thing. So what, for example, we also applied the model to, um, to, uh, uh, to birds where we looked at whether elevation uh, uh, influences uh, diversification. But then of course, there might also be latitudinal differences, right? Or, uh, you know, tropical versus temperate. So you have these two uh, properties that you can then look at in a, in a combined way and look at all the different possible states. Yeah, I think that would be um, interesting with that group because obviously they're, they're split between habitats as well. So you've got the rocky shore versus sandy dwellers versus these shallow water ones, which are often, as I said, in the, um, their, their shell bed specialists. Yeah. Well, so th there's, there's just one sort of... Um, a problem, of course, I mean, we, the number of shallow water species that we have here is already pretty low. If you actually you have more categories, of course, then at, at some po point you lose the power. So that's a bit of a problem with, you know, of course it might be an, inter an, an important driver, but whether we can actually de detect it in the end, that might be problematic. So it's something to take into account. So of course for the birds, we, we looked at the, the, the global bird tree in that case. So there's always something. Uh, there, all the categories would be represented. But in this case, it might be a lot harder to do. But we could look at it separately as well, of course. Thanks. Um, hi, uh, Diego Barnesh from the University of Exeter, up here. Ah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for the very interesting talk. So I'm wondering if there's evidence about uh, if there's been any change in depth variation over time, and if so, how could that uh, affect your conclusions? Yeah, so of course there have been lots of changes in the depth, but of course the, the Lake Tanganyika has, uh, is a very deep lake. And uh, so most, most of these fish, of course, live in the sort of the top layer, even though 30 meters is, is pretty deep. But then, uh, so even if the water goes down, it doesn't affect it in, uh, that much in that way. Uh, we did look actually also at it, this is a bit, it's, uh, it's not related to this particular model, but one of the, the other ideas of why there is so much diversification in, in, in these cichlids in Lake Tanganyika is that actually there is a sort of a species pump idea. It's actually that the water level changes might have uh, created multiple lakes at some point in time. And actually there is also evidence that it actually occurred over uh, uh, macroevolutionary uh, time. And, and that actually might also create uh, diversification. So of course, I mean, we're always like simplifying um, actually, in that particular case where we studied it, we did find also some evidence that diversification is at, at least to some degree driven by these water level changes. Uh, the problem is always if you want to combine these two uh, things, uh, it becomes incredibly hard to actually really analyze it because the models become very complicated. But it's definitely a way, a way forward. Okay, perhaps one uh, last question, a short one and a short answer, please. So So, are you quick? Where's the <laughs> so, su super quick question. Um, so, and, I might you, miss, uh, and you might have already answered this, Rampal, but you said there was no trait change during speciation. So, how does speciation happen? So, in your mind, then, is it this isolation caused by the shifting, um, the, the shifting depths of the lakes that is actually serving to, to, to separate species, and then, then? It's later that the trait changes might happen? Does that I, make sense? I don't quite understand you. So you're asking how speciation occurs? Yeah. Uh, so, well, this is sort of the uh, black box in our model, right? So we're just, we're just seeing species, that we're right, seeing right. speciation events in the tree. And actually also, there, we're also modeling the unobserved ones uh, for species that went extinct. Um, so we didn't actually really look at the, the, the causes of diversification, except of course that maybe, you know, this, this uh, diversification might be like a divergence between the different uh, trade states, uh, like, you know, generally splitting up into uh, uh, two specialists. But other than that, it, it's more or less, we're just looking at the, 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 pa the diversification rates uh, patterns that we observed. Okay, we have to leave it here. Uh, thank you, Aaron Paul, for your uh, talk.
So next speaker is Renske Onstein, and she will talk about palm radiations. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, so I will talk a little bit about why some tropical islands, or many actually, are so species rich. And the main message is that we shouldn't forget about biotic interactions that may be driving um, radiations and therefore diversity. So first, let's have a look at global richness, uh, in this case of vascular plants on the world. And the dark red purplish colors indicate the areas with the highest uh, species richness. And of course, what you can see is that diversity is highest in tropical regions, but also on many tropical islands, um, especially here in Southeast Asia, um, but of course also Madagascar and several islands in the Caribbean. So one idea that could explain this high species richness in the tropics is the extraordinary number of biotic interactions happening here. So this is groups of organisms which support the diversification and the persistence of other groups of organisms. And an example of such a biotic interaction would be frugivory, so fruit eating and seed dispersal of plants by animals. And this is indeed very important, especially in tropical rainforests, where up to 94% of the woody plants depend on these frugivores for their seed dispersal. So how could this interaction then influence biodiversity patterns? So this could be through the effect on speciation rate. So we look at the side from the plants now. So by eating the fruits and dispersing the seeds, the frugivores of course determine the establishment of new plant populations. They will determine the amount of gene flow between these populations. And ultimately they will therefore possibly facilitate reproductive isolation if gene flow is limited. So if these processes happen with a particular fast rate, for whatever reason, you could detect a shift in the diversification or the speciation rate on a phylogeny, so in macroevolutionary time. Now we also know that the interaction between frugivores and plants is non-random. So frugivores may have a preference for certain fruits based on the size and the color and the shape, for example, and of course, this fruit preference is also influenced by the ecological traits of the animals, such as their body size, their gait width, their color vision. So here, I will focus on this relationship between fruit size and, and animal body size, or frugivore body size, comparing plants with, well, what I call small fruits. So these are smaller than four centimeters, so they can still be quite big, but they rely entirely on, on birds, bats, and smaller bodied mammals, mainly for their dispersal. And we compare these to large me megafauna fruits, so at least of four centimeters. And these, of course, need very large animals, so large bodied mammals uh, or tortoises um, for their dispersal. So you can think of elephants, um, tapirs, and of course, extinct megafauna. And these large-bodied animals are also most important for long-distance dispersal events because they have the largest home range sizes. So because they have a preference for the largest fruits, we can expect that long-distance dispersal happens more often in large fruits or plants with large fruits. And this may therefore increase gene flow between large fruited plant populations and potentially decrease the chance of these plants to speciate as compared to small fruited plants which have often a much more restricted dispersal by sedentary frugivores in the understory, for example. And occasional long-distance dispersal may then facilitate new populations which could evolve into new species. So this is what I call the fruit size hypothesis, how fruit size may influence speciation in uh, tropical plants. Of course, it's not just fruit size. In addition to fruit size, colonization of islands for that, of course, you need the smaller fruits to be dispersed by uh, birds and bats that can colonize these islands, may have given additional boost to speciation due to the isolation of these islands. So it may be the interaction between small fruits and getting to islands that may actually um, have the highest speciation chance. And then, in addition, looking at trade changes on islands, um, as we heard several times this week, 
there is the idea that on islands you might want to reduce your dispersibility. So plants have been shown to have increases in fruit size or seed size, um, which are correlated, especially in the clay that we'll look at. So we may expect that then islands actually select for slightly larger fruits and seeds than mainlands um, do. So to summarize the hypotheses we have, so first of all, we expect that plants with large megafauna fruits have lower speciation rates than plants with smaller fruits. We expect that dispersal to oceanic islands, so isolated islands, may increase, additionally increase the chance to speciate. And we also expect that islands select for slightly larger fruits than mainlands or continental islands. So I tested these hypotheses in the Arecaceae family, so the palm family, a typical tropical rainforest plant. It has a, a group, it has a global distribution, of course, also on many islands. Um, it has in total 2,500 species, and here I indicated how many of those have what we call small fruits, so smaller than four centimeters, and how many large. And of course, the majority has smaller fruits than four centimeters, but there's still nowadays at least 229 species with these very large megafaunal fruits. And you can see a couple of examples here of these very large fruits. We can also look at fruit size in a phylogenetic context. So here we look at the probability that ancestral lineages had these large megafaunal fruits in palms. Um, and that's indicated by the yellow color. So palms are about 116 million years old, and it seems there's a high probability that they had very large fruits during this time. And of course, this is the time that dinosaurs were hopping around. So these may have been the initial dispersers of these large fruits. And there are also examples of fossilized palm seeds in fossilized dinosaur dung. But of course, yeah, we can't be sure about that. The other thing we see is that in many times within palms, there have been transitions indicated from yellow to gray towards smaller fruits. Also, if we look at the colonization of oceanic islands in palms, indicated with the yellow color, we see that we can't really be sure about the ancestral states, but many lineages nowadays indicated with yellow occur on these oceanic islands. So there probably have been many transitions to these islands during palm history. So for the first hypothesis, we want to see whether palms with large megafaunal fruits have lower speciation rates than palms with small fruits. So we use, like Rampa gave a good introduction, we use these diversification rate models to test this, where we have the phylogenetic data, which is dated by use of fossils. And for the species that live today, we have data on whether they have small or large fruits. And then we fit uh, a range of models to the tree where we ask whether small fruited lineages have different speciation, extinction, and transition rates than large fruited lineages. So transition refers to the transition from small to large fruit or the other way around. So we fit several models and we select the best model given the fewest number of parameters. And we run this then in a Bayesian context to get some uncertainty on the estimates of the rates. So this is what the results look like. So we have speciation rates on the y-axis in blue, we look at these large megafaunal fruited lineages, and in yellow, the small fruited lineages. So globally, we do see a tendency indeed for these large fruited lineages to have lower speciation rates, but of course, there's a lot of uncertainty around these estimates as well. We can do the same by looking at new world versus old world palms, and now we see that this global signal is mainly driven by diversification of palms in the old world. So for the second question, we asked whether it may also um, a, be a role for island colonizations to facilitate speciation. But of course, to get to islands, you need these slightly smaller fruits to be eaten by birds and bats. So we have two traits in the models, um, in this model. Um, and the way we fit this, for example, for speciation rate, is by, again, performing model selection, and we have a base model, so that would be speciation of palms on continents uh, or mainland islands, uh, mainland or continental islands, and having these very large fruits. And we ask, does speciation change if we add the evolution of small fruits or the evolution of island colonization to the model? 
And then last, is there support for an interaction effect? That's rates of speciation are different if you have both. So and you evolve small fruits and you colonize an island. So let's have a look at the results. So again, speciation rate here. We have the base model. Then we have the additive effects of evolving small fruits and colonizing islands. And then in the global model, we also found support for this interaction term, showing that if you have small fruits and you colonize islands, you have the fastest speciation rate. And again, looking at this for new world and old world palms, we again see that this is mainly an old world phenomenon where really the largest speciation is found on islands with palms with smaller fruits. So then what happened to these palms when they got to these islands? Was there indeed a tendency for fruits and seeds, therefore, to become bigger? So I should mention that in palms, all fruits have only one or two seeds, so it's strongly correlated to seed size. So to test this, we fit different models um, where we look at the evolution of fruit size. So in, in this case, as a continuous trait. So we have, for example, brownie emotion would be kind of like random evolution where you inherit your traits, your fruit size from your ancestor with some kind of variance around it. But we can also see, for example, with the ornstein ullenbeck model with different optima, whether fruit size may evolve towards a different optimum on islands versus mainland on continental islands. And there are different variations of these models indicated here, uh, which I won't go into detail now. But the best model is indeed this ornstein ullenbeck model, uh, indicating that islands have a slightly different optimum for fruit size than the mainland. And there's also support for a slightly different strength of selection towards this optimum, but as you can see over here with the, the estimates, the selection strength is actually very similar. But on mainland and continental islands, fruit sizes are slightly smaller than on islands. So it seems indeed that there might be a tendency in palms to evolve larger fruits on islands. So in conclusion, we've seen that palms with small fruits have high speciation rates. And we think this might be linked to this restricted dispersal behavior of understory frugivores, which of them have a sedentary behavior combined with occasional long distance dispersal to establish new populations. But we also see it's not just fruit size that explains palm speciation. It's probably an interaction with other traits, such as colonization of islands, um, which we found strong support in the old world. So why only in the old world? Why not in the new world? So, First of all, I have to say that palms in the old world mainly occur in the Southeast Asia and Australasia regions. So African mainland palms is only 5%. And this means that most of this diversification indeed happened in this island-dominated environment. Second, we know that on these islands and this region in particular, there's a very high species richness of frugivorous birds and bats, such as the fruit pigeons and the hornbills and the fruit bats that are known to successfully colonize remote islands. Um, and there have also been observations of palm fruits that they um, dispersed. And many of the neotropical um, families of frugivores lack representative species on islands. So it seems that neotropical birds, for whatever reason, don't often cross large bodies of water. On top of that, the New World seems to have fewer oceanic islands, and there may also be differences in the age and the size between the Old World and New World. I didn't look at that specifically, but this may also explain why it didn't happen in the New World as much as in the Old World. And this, of course, may therefore all together explain the relative scarcity of palms um, on New World islands, oceanic islands versus uh, Old World islands. So 8% of New World palms occurs on islands versus 28% in the Old World, which is quite a difference. So the other thing we saw is that palms indeed may show a tendency to become, have bigger fruits on islands, slightly bigger. Um, of course, not as big as these megafaunal fruits I looked at for the effect on speciation, although there are several examples of megafaunal fruited palms on islands. Um, you probably know the double coconut, the largest seed in the world. And the theory behind this is that 
these larger fruits may actually reduce dispersibility, so you make sure your seeds don't end up in the sea. Um, of course, there's other benefits of having larger seeds and larger fruits, such as uh, having a higher survival as a juvenile and uh, facilitating germination. Um, and of course, in addition to changes in fruit size, there may be correlated changes in other traits, uh, such as plant height, um, which may additionally, well, have a selective role in this, in this environment. So the take home message, you can forget everything else, is that when you look at the extraordinary species richness of tropical islands, don't forget to think about how biotic interactions between the plants and the animals, for example, may explain some of this very high diversity. And with that, I would like to thank my co-authors um, and funding agencies and some of this work has already been published here, so if you would like to read a bit more, um, please read that, and part is also new. And I'd like to take questions if you have any. Thank you, Irinske. <laughs> I'm sure there are questions. Sorry. Thanks, it's, it's really wonderful. Uh, but I have a very simple geographical question. Where is your limit of the New World uh, Islands in the Pacific Ocean? Is so Hawaiian is Sagan. Hawaiian New World uh, or Old World? That was still Old World. Yeah, so we had to make a cut, of course, and yeah, you, we can discuss about that. But in this case, yeah, it, it was part of the Old World. Hi, Renske. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering. There may be a very simple reason, but. Um, so seed size is a continuously varying trait, but you treated it as a categorical one with a four centimeter cutoff. So why was that? So several reasons, actually. So one of them is that these diversification rate models, um, especially if you want to test two traits, like also islands, well, at the moment only exist for binary traits. But I also tested it in a continuous with quasi, and I got the same support. But the other reason, which is actually maybe more important, is, is the ecological um, uh, division. Because I was really interested in those very large fruits that entirely rely on mammals. Like there's no birds, or maybe yeah, some of the flightless birds, but in principle no bird or bat that could swallow fruits that big. So yeah, so that's, if you have these large-bodied mammals you rely on, they have a very, well, large home range sizes, especially historically. So I would really expect a difference in speciation then. Whether in these small fruits, there's lots of things probably happening that facilitate speciation. But yeah, but it, it was basically this ecolo ecological reason to, to make the, the four centimeter cutoff. Any more questions? We still have time. Perhaps a question that uh, I can uh, well pose. Uh, would you expect the same results if, if the cutoff would, for instance, be like five centimeters or, or six or, or two? Yeah, or, or I, I did that. So with larger values, um, like five and six, I, I tried. Of course, the sample size becomes smaller and, and that's an issue, but it still worked. And I got the same result. With two centimeters, or I, I also tried 3.5. I also still had the same results. Two, I didn't try. I, I guess there will be changes then. It might be different. I would expect that. Okay, if there are no further questions, I want to thank Renske for a nice presentation. <laughs> so our last speaker of this uh, symposium is Anna Papadopoulou. She will talk about beetle diversification. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Frederick and Jose Maria for inviting me to this, uh, such a, uh, to this very exciting symposium, and all of you for being here. Uh, so as we've seen in the previous talks, uh, trade-dependent diversification is primarily addressed within a macroevolutionary framework. But uh, in this presentation, we'll try to argue that there is a complementary approach 
uh, where you can try to explore the role of uh, traits uh, in the diversification process within a much smaller temporal and spatial scale. So what I'm actually uh, saying is not really new. It's basically within the context of uh, comparative phylogeography. So as you know, traditionally comparative phylogeography has been using a uh, phylogeographic concordance among multiple co-distributed species to try to infer the uh, role of uh, biogeographic events in driving population divergence and diversification. So in a kind of a similar way, uh, one can use the uh, phylogeographic concordance, uh, uh, discordance, sorry, among multiple co-distributed species um, in order to try to f uh, uh, infer the role of taxon-specific traits uh, in population divergence. So for example, uh, if you uh, look at multiple uh, species across uh, these three islands, um, multiple uh, beetle species, for example, and you find that, uh, uh, that's a very simplified example I'm using now, and you find that all the flightless uh, beetle species, they are all uh, so uh, uh, a strong geographical structure and uh, deep population divergence, while all the flighted ones, they do not, so they don't show any geographical structure. That could be an indication that maybe flightless could be a factor that uh, can uh, contribute to uh, a population divergence and eventually diversification. So I have been uh, uh, for a long time interested in uh, links between uh, population level processes and diversification patterns. And I really like this paper uh, by the Nations and Janssen where they're, they're talking about the role of population persistence in speciation rates. So if you think of uh, a lineage which uh, splits into two intraspecific lineages, uh, so, uh, so you, and then you need these two intraspecific lineages to persist for long enough until they reach reproductive isolation. Uh, but the alternative could be that one of the two intraspecific lineages could get extinct, or uh, the two lineages may get uh, eventually merged uh, again because of a subsequent gene flow. So if you think of that within an island setting, think of one island that uh, is fragmented into two smaller islands, and so the question is whether these two populations will uh, speciate, will uh, develop reproductive isolation. That uh, could uh, uh, depend on many different traits that affect the persistence of the uh, two interspecific lineages on these two islands. So for example, if you have a big mammal, it may not persist in a very, on a very small island. Or uh, you can, each of you can think of different traits, uh, of course, depending on the group of, uh, that you're working on. For example, for palms, as we just heard, that could be um, uh, the fruit size uh, that can affect actually the, uh, the uh, possibility of being transferred from the one uh, island to the other. And uh, you can uh, think of many different traits that can affect uh, uh, either the merging of the two lineages uh, or uh, the extinction of one of these two lineages. So I gave this example of one island fragmented into two because I'm actually working on oceanic islands. And things in Oceanic Islands are quite different from, uh, sorry, I'm actually working on continental islands, sorry. Uh, so, um, and, uh, uh, so there, con in continental islands, uh, things are pretty different from what you see on the Oceanic Archipelago. So, in Oceanic Archipelagos, um, you have new islands emerging, which uh, uh, provides uh, empty ecological niches and that uh, provides uh, uh, ecological opportunity that leads uh, very often to adaptive diversification. So adaptive diversification pre prevalent in oceanic archipelagos, but not as much in continental archipelagos, where you have mostly the main process is island fragmentation, where you uh, get um, uh, the, the uh, ecological uh, space is filled uh, since the beginning. So. Uh, you, there are the main processes geographic isolation, so you have a lot of non-adaptive diversification going on. Um, and I'm working on uh, the Aegean archipelago, which is uh, mostly a continental archipelago, so this uh, whole region that uh, today is the Aegean, it used to be a, a united landmass that started to break uh, uh, into smaller uh, fragments to huge tectonic activity about 10 million years ago and has been uh, since uh, broken into uh, the islands that we know today. But these islands have, some of these islands have been uh, con um, uh, connected again during low sea level uh, periods. Um, and um, there are several, uh, what is interesting about the, one of the things that is, are interesting about the Aegean Archipelago is that there are several lineages that have uh, been proposed to uh, have undergone non adaptive diversification. So in, there are several lineages that where you can find many local endemics on the uh, found on uh, 
a few of these islands, but other lineages that have not basically diversified, so it's a single species across the whole archipelago. So um, I've been very interested in uh, understanding why some lineages actually diversify more than others across the same geographic setting. Um, so I'm working on uh, darkling beetles, and these are the most abundant insects on this island, which are, as they are uh, specifically adapted to the dry conditions of these islands. They're also pretty uniform uh, in uh, their ecology, so they're all flightless, they're all soil dwelling, they're detritivores. But they do differ in important ecological traits, which is habitat association. So some of them are uh, found only in sand, uh, in sand habitats, so mostly sand dunes and sandy beaches that are across the coast, uh, while the ones that are associated with compact soil, they're mostly found in inland habitats, mostly shrublands, uh, that is the dominant habitat type on this island. There are just a few general, only two basically, that are generalists, uh, so they're found uh, equally, uh, in equal abundance in both uh, types of habitats. And my hypothesis here is that um, these two types of habitats, they have a, a different, they're different in terms of their stability. So uh, you ex I expect the soil habitats to be much more stable through time, while the sand habitats to be more, much more disturbed. And this uh, uh, might have an uh, effect on the uh, population persistence and therefore on diversification of these different lineages. So um, I have been looking at uh, diversification across the central Aegean archipelago. Uh, at different uh, scales. Basically, initially, I looked at uh, uh, the whole uh, of the Central Aegean Archipelago, and the, across this main, there is a main biogeographic barrier, so that was the, uh, it's called the mid Aegean Trends, and this is the deepest part of the archipelago, and was the first that was formed, the first break of, of the continent, the previous continent, what was formed about uh, 12 to 9 million years ago, and these two parts of the archipelago have been actually uh, separated uh, since at least the end of the Mycenaean salinity crisis. So um, that I started this work uh, during my PhD, so that's uh, an old paper of 2009. So uh, I found this uh, uh, group, this uh, uh, genus, where it's actually, it's a species complex, and it's uh, divided into these two clades. The one is uh, I found is associated with soil habitats, and it's deeply diversified across the archipelago. And then there is uh, the lower clade, the sun clade. Uh, it's basically has not basically identified, acro uh, diversified across the archipelago. And that these are two sister clades. So that was a nice example of possibly uh, the uh, uh, indication that habitat type may play a role. Um, then I. Um, looked at other genera, unfortunately, this, uh, this, uh, I, I have to also to say that these are tiny beetles and they're basically uh, identical morphologically, they're very difficult to distinguish, they have just a tiny uh, difference in genitalia, but otherwise all the external morphology is totally identical. But this is the only case of a genus that has these two uh, discrete clades, all the other genera, uh, most of the other genera are uh, only either on soil or found in sand. Um, but the general pattern is very similar, so all the soil clades, uh, they're highly diversified across the archipelago versus the sand clades that are basically, uh, so very little diversification. And actually, the, uh, uh, the soil uh, um, lineages, they so very good, sorry, uh, uh, high congruence with uh, uh, the, the, the groups that they form, uh, this, uh, uh, let's say, mitochondria clusters, because these are basically mitochondria trees. Um, they uh, correspond very well to the geological history of the archipelago, while in the sun uh, uh, lineages, uh, these, they have very little uh, structure, but this structure also does not really correspond with the geological history of the archipelago. And then we have these two genera that they uh, are generalists, and they show somehow an intermediate level of uh, diversification. But they still correspond uh, with the uh, uh, geological history of the archipelago. Um, so after that, I started looking at a, a little bit of a smaller a scale. So within this, there is this uh, uh, complex of islands in the center of the archipelago, which have been connected and disconnected several times during the uh, glacial cycles. Um, so this is called the Cycladic Plateau. Uh, and I've looked at uh, um, the uh, population divergence within this uh, um, island complex. And I find something quite similar. So uh, again, the, uh, the soil species, they so much uh, uh, stronger geographic structure than the sand ones that uh, do not really show any structure. Um, 
and actually I, I uh, estimated divergence times across, uh, on the one hand, the, this permanent barrier between uh, the eastern and the western part of the archipelago, and uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, across this, let's say, dynamic barrier. So this is uh, quite deep here, it's 95 meters deep, but still uh, these islands have been uh, connected during the last glacial maximum. So what I found is that uh, um, actually for the stable habitat species, uh, uh, in both cases we find deep divergences. The divergent times are uh, obviously uh, uh, deeper here than here, but in both cases we do find uh, deep divergences in, uh, across both permanent and dynamic barrier. In the uh, soil species we only find uh, very, very shallow divergences in both cases. And the generalist we find deep divergences across the uh, permanent barrier, but very shallow divergences among this, uh, uh, across this uh, dynamic barrier. Um, so I'm, I've started looking uh, actually now at uh, even so smaller uh, spatial scales using a higher resolution data. Uh, so uh, for just, uh, I, I'm now focusing, zooming in this uh, uh, group of um, islands that is uh, actually has been uh, connected uh, uh, a few thousand years ago because they're uh, co uh, separated by shallow waters. And um, uh, I have been generating uh, genomic data using uh, genome-wide data uh, using double digest rat sequencing. Uh, so far we have only sequenced five species. The plan is to do it for many more of those uh, lineages. So it's kind of preliminary data what I'm, I'm going to show you now. Um, so, um, well, uh, the first thing we looked at is like patterns of gene flow. So um, uh, what uh, uh, I'm showing you first the results of this uh, kind of bigger beetles where you do find a, a pattern of isolation uh, by distance. These are, uh, I don't know if you can see very well the graphs, but so these are uh, FSTs, uh, uh, grand defined genetic differentiation. Uh, FSTs are slightly higher in a, a soil than this general species, but um, uh, in both cases, we do find a correlation between genetic differentiation and distance. It's actually much better when you, so in the first column, we're just using geographic distance, so uh, straight geographic distance, while here we're, um, we're using the bathymetric data to scale the geographic distance, so we take all the possible paths of the connections among the populations, and uh, we weight them differently depending on the bathymetry, and uh, in both cases, uh, um, the this model, which is uh, 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 taking into account the bathymetry, fits the data better and even more for the general species. Uh, for these very tiny beetles, so both the sand and the soil uh, uh, population of these tiny beetles, we don't really find any correlation between um, uh, uh, FST and uh, the genetic differentiation and, and geographic distance for uh, bathymetric uh, resistance. And, uh, um, and uh, the FSTs are kind of uh, higher, so in both cases we find, uh, if this is the uh, line of the general species, you can see that all the, uh, most of the FST values are higher for the very small uh, beetles. Uh, and the reason might be different between the two, the sand and the soil population. So the sand population, you see there, is very low genetic diversity, uh, and the uh, soil populations are much higher. So that's, um, you, um, uh, you can get a better uh, idea of why is that if you look at the results of the uh, um, anal demographic analysis. So here uh, we've been looking at the changes of affected population size through time, and uh, we find that uh, the soil populations they uh, have uh, been uh, subject to very strong bottlenecks. Um, so uh, you can see here like really strong bottlenecks compared to the soil populations that uh, uh, have uh, less change in the affected population size. So that can explain this uh, high FSTs in the sand populations. Um, while in the case of the soil populations, it uh, must be just that they are actually very, they stay with the other, there's not much flow, gene flow between them. Um, that is part of the work of my PhD student, Emmanuel Melamelliotakis, uh, who is presenting his poster uh, in the next session. So um, uh, if you want to find out more about the work he's doing on these uh, small beetles, uh, you can check his poster. Um, and now we have been uh, also looking at uh, multi-population models and trying to uh, 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 um, estimate at the same time uh, uh, 
divergence times and uh, uh, migration rates and affected population sizes. Um, these are very preliminary results, but generally the idea is that there are uh, different divergence times in these uh, soil uh, species, higher migration rates in the general species, and uh, stronger population bottlenecks in the sand species. So more generally, like an overview of uh, uh, what I presented from like uh, conclusions from uh, comparing all these different scales is that uh, in the uh, soil species, we have a lower gene flow, uh, higher population resistance, and therefore high diversification. In the sand uh, uh, populations, uh, we get more um, an effect of local extinctions and recolonizations, uh, and that's why we don't see a high diversification. And the generalist uh, lineages, uh, we do see there's some diversification, but not within uh, across islands that have been uh, subsequently connected. So they seem to be moving more across the island bridges. Um, so the conclusions, um, main conclusions from my talk. So the first is the importance of trait-mediated population persistence in diversification. And a more general one is that the importance of linking micro and macroevolutionary approaches to gain insights into the role of traits in diversification. And of course, there are many considerations. So um, um, I, I think that if we want to draw more conclusions from uh, such uh, population level comparisons, we need uh, uh, to develop more uh, modeling approaches, for example, for continuous landscapes. There are, uh, modeling approaches that they take, uh, uh, they use uh, environmental niche modeling to inform demographic simulations, and I'm hoping that at some point they will, will also be able to incorporate uh, the different models of evol uh, island evolution to inform a uh, spatially and temporally explicit simulation for demographic simulations for islands as well. So uh, I would like to thank um, all my co-authors and the funding, and all of you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Anna. Questions for Anna? Is everybody so tired? <laughs> no, my talk was so bad, nobody <laughs> I think everybody is very hungry. My, or <laughs> just, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I really enjoyed your your talk. I um, I came from a different field, etc. So please excuse my <laughs> my naive question. But uh, did you try? Uh, so you have uh, separated, categorized your beetles into um, according to their to the substrate where they occur, but. I was wondering here if the the results would be very different. I don't know if this even makes sense. I'm sorry. Uh, it would be very different if you c would consider high dispersal and uh, low dispersal among your beetles. So it would be an entirely different study, of course. But uh, so you well, uh, perhaps uh, wingspan or even they don't, size. They don't fly. Okay. So they don't fly, any of them. Uh, body size could be an indication, like it uh, could be, I mean, I have, I have some indications that didn't really show those results, but smaller beetles move less than bigger beetles. So that could be, uh, uh, I, I, when we talk about land bridges, so cross islands have been connected actually, but um, uh, otherwise they don't fly. None of them are really able to fly. So they, how they move, yeah? Yes, so by the wind or something. Yeah, so that's another, so yeah, maybe the, especially the tiny ones can be by wind or like, a, uh, like a, on a small wood piece or something. So uh, the idea is that the, the sand ones, because uh, there are probably a little bit of uh, a random dispersal going on with other factors, but so the, because the soil ones, they are, uh, generally, the, the, they're stable, so they have uh, constantly filled niches. So if uh, one goes there, there is no uh, um, empty ecological niche to colonize. But for the sand ones, my interpretation is that because there is constant extinction, if uh, uh, there is also constant recolonization, because there is 
uh, empty ecological needs because of the destruction of the uh, sand habitat. So uh, in a way there is more dispersal in the sand ones, but this is not due to inherent uh, dif uh, differences in dispersal ability, but because of the uh, sta habitat stability, differences in habitat stability. At least that's my interpretation. But it's a good point, yes. Thank you. Just a naive question again. <laughs> Thank you for your talk, Anna. It was really interesting. But uh, how can you uh, know the distribution of the sandy areas through time? Yeah, so that's a good point. So they're not stable. That's the thing. So that's I I, I don't know it through time, of course. Uh, obviously, but uh, I don't think exactly because it has been changing a lot through time. These populations have not been there for a long time. So. That's part of this uh, extinction recolonization process that I'm talking about. That because they're very dynamic, these systems, that uh, uh, makes like the whole uh, extinction recolonization dynamics, and that doesn't let the people, to, uh, the beetles, to diversify. But what I mean is, is there any previous knowledge, like in Sahara, with the pollen studies? Can you know more or less which uh, for which uh, how long they have been with Sandy or? Areas not or not? Really, there there are no, data, okay. unfortunately. If there are no further questions, I would like to thank Anna for her contribution. So this uh, concludes our symposium on trade dependent diversification. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for coming and thank you f uh, to all the contributors, to all the speakers of, t of uh, this uh, symposium. So, thanks. <laughs>